Okay, good afternoon. Hope you're enjoying the day so far. Um, so I'm here, I, I don't like being behind the desk, but I don't have much of a choice. I'm here to talk about to you about uh, OpenShift at Amadeus. So this is an adventure that started a couple of years back now for us, uh, in 2014, in fact. And so I'll talk about what, a little bit about what we do, our needs, a bit where we're at, and uh, I'll also talk then about one of the aspects that's being worked on that we're pushing for a bit and that is of interest to us, therefore. So we're a technology company. We provide technology solutions to the travel industry. So we're helping content providers, uh, content uh, operators, uh, content distributors all link up. Uh, maybe, for instance, uh, we take uh, airline availability and uh, make it available to, to travel agents, online travel agents, uh, and we also um, focus on the traveler experience. In fact, that's central to, to what we do, uh, from inspiration through search, purchase, uh, during the trip, finding a hotel, uh, recovering your lost luggage uh, after the trip, things like that. Yeah, not just the pleasant stuff. So, a few technical figures. Uh, we handled last year about 566 million uh, bookings, boarded 747 million passengers. Uh, in fact, we also acquired a few years back a company called Navitair, and so that figure is excluding their passengers boarded as well. With theirs, it goes up above a billion. We host 130 airline inventories. That means that basically the, the inventory saying how many seats are available on a given plane and things like that at a given time are, are hosted in our systems. And we handle about 50,000 end user queries per second and our enterprise service bus peaks now at over 500,000 uh, queries per second. That was the figure for last year. So we have a couple of constraints in terms of the types of data objects that we handle. We have uh, reservation records. You may have heard of the, the PNR, the passenger name record. Uh, there are other more modern names, structured booking record and uh, things like that. Uh, I already mentioned the, the inventories, uh, content provider inventories, so airline inventories, rail inventories. Uh, things like that. These are objects which, of course, we need to handle in consistent manners. We don't want uh, double bookings uh, in a hotel, for instance. Uh, you don't want to end up at the hotel finding that someone else already has your room. All that kind of thing. So we need fairly high consistency and we need uh, uh, sort of transactional mechanisms and we need low response times because, of course, people don't like to wait uh, the, usual, the usual thing. So in 2014, we came to realize through various uh, reasons, there was a bit of a build up to this, but we realized that we needed to go start working on a new platform for our applications. Um, historically, we had a, a system like uh, a lot of uh, folks where we have thousands of physical servers running many, many different applications, serving many thousands of different services and on different channels. It can be web, it can be more traditional, uh, traditional or legacy, I don't know, host to host and things like that. And we were now in a position where, well, we want still to continue growing, uh, we want to expand, we need to control costs. Uh, we also have, uh, we, we are operating mainly out of one data center in Germany. So for customers around the world, that means that you can't beat the, feast, uh, the speed of light. You have some latency that is there embedded in, in, the, in the physics uh, of, your, of your placement. So we wanted to get closer to our customers. We also had requirements to maybe install our, uh, our applications on customer premises. Um, so that meant also knowing how to remote, uh, remote operate. We were also seeing a lot of disruption in the travel industry model. Um, 
Uh, previously, you were maybe seeing 10 to 1 look-to-book ratios on, on airline, and now we're looking more at things like 10,000 to 1 or, I don't know, 100,000 to 1. There are, there are lots of different figures flying around, but the, the whole internet age and mobile and things like that has changed, changed the, um, the way things work an awful lot. So this basically led us to okay, a new platform, also the realization that we would need to be capable of working on hybrid cloud, so working with public cloud providers, but also on-premise private cloud. And we also realized that we wanted something which was beyond mere infrastructure as a service. Uh, allocating a, a virtual machine uh, through, through code is one thing, but in fact, for the developer experience, but also the operator experience in terms of simplification and uh, decoupling the actions and what different people have to manage. We couldn't simply just say, okay, we, we go for infrastructure as a service and allocate VMs, you get your VMs and you have to administrate your VMs as developers and uh, manage the software on there, all that kind of thing. So we saw that we wanted something above that and that brought us to the platform as a service. Uh, we also knew that we wanted something that was more akin to you have a workload and you throw it at the system and it figures out where to run things all by itself depending on the resources available and how much your workload is going to consume. We also, th there's, okay, I mean, there's an awful lot of problems that you have to deal with, which is testing, um, you, you simply can't test all the configurations. It's not possible. Or when you do a software load, for instance, you know perfectly well that there are going to be different versions of different software running simultaneously and that you can't have pure atomic switches between a combination of software levels of your different components. So, okay, uh, I won't talk too much about this slide. This slide, I think, should be known to most people now. I mean, containers, Docker, Kubernetes, OpenShift. Uh, what we developed on top is what we call Amadeus Cloud Services, which is our internal product, our internal pass, built mainly on OpenShift, and which basically, its existence is there to fill the gaps. So, typical example, OpenShift, Kubernetes are not yet suited to running databases. And so we needed to also manage the data storage part as part of our pass and provide that to, to um, our end users. There was also, um, when we started using OpenShift, there wasn't monitoring as part of OpenShift. And so we developed a solution of our own. A lot of this, we intend to see it go to the left over time, and it's already started. There are things that we were doing in ACS, in our Amadeus Cloud Services, which we've got rid of because they've now been implemented in OpenShift. One of the examples that I like, because I actually coded the awful workaround back in the beginning, was that you had to open the ports in IP tables for your services to, to be able to reach the, the pods on your, on your OpenShift nodes. And since 3.2, that is now done by OpenShift automatically. So my code went the way of the bin, and I'm very happy with that. And the more that happens, the happier I am. So today we have several projects in the pipe. We have a, a hotel CRS, a customer reservation system, which will be serving out of the United States. Uh, uh, soon, uh, we have in production Amadeus Airline Cloud Availability, which is running on several regions on public cloud providers. Um, so throughout the world, we have deployments in Europe, in Asia, in the United States, and we're really to see, happy to see that serving uh, low latency, well, yeah, fairly low latency, it's uh, to the order of 200 milliseconds, I think, or less. Uh, requests for airline uh, availability and we're running this so this is a this is four four clusters on uh, Asia Europe and United States we actually have a, a lot more of them running and they're serving very happily several thousand transactions per second 
and that's working really well and our operations folks are very happy with that. Now coming to where we want to go, there are lots of OpenShift evolutions that we're interested in. One that uh, I will focus on a little bit more is stateful sets that Clayton already mentioned this morning. We're also interested in following the monitoring aspect because as I mentioned, we implemented a monitoring stack of our own, but we're interested in seeing where OpenShift is going and possibly moving to that. We are, for fairly obvious reasons, because I mentioned that we've got lots of, a number of clusters already worldwide uh, running Amadeus Airline Cloud availability. We're un interested in cluster federation to give uh, a single view and a single way, uh, a single point of entry for administering multiple clusters. Oh, self-hosting, that's actually I'm interested in, not the rest. Uh, so by self-hosting, I mean that uh, there's a, a line of thought where Kubernetes uh, can, in fact, run Kubernetes inside itself, and so your, your masters are containers that are scheduled by the other masters and things like that. So I, I'm just interested in that because I like the brain surgery aspect. Um, so then also we're interested in the sophisticated scheduling aspects. So this is uh, rescheduling, for instance, when the system sees that there are things that are interfering with each other in bad ways. Uh, maybe a, a, a node is, is kind of limited. Uh, maybe you have a lot of fragmentation and you want to undo the fragmentation across the system. Uh, one aspect that we're really very much interested in in an immediate way is the third-party resources and aggregated servers aspects. We see quite a lot of use cases for third-party resources, so that's basically the idea that you can extend OpenShift and Kubernetes to include and integrate functionality of your own. And we, for instance, uh, there's a, a, a guy I work with who's been working on uh, a Redis cluster operator uh, type of uh, object so that a Redis cluster can be managed sort of natively inside OpenShift. So to date we've done that using config maps but we'd actually like to use third party resources to give a more fluid uh, integration. And we have a, a couple of other use cases for that. And then the, the next level up of that is to actually have it available through a service catalog. So some of you are paying attention, maybe noticed that Paul Marie this morning was talking about Service Catalog because he's one of the um, leads on that. Final point, security, always very important. Uh, one of the things that we've had to deal with is encryption of secrets. So at the moment we have a, a, a solution, but it's not, it's not, very, it's not a well-integrated solution. And so we're following closely as well the, the progress and the design on the uh, encryption at rest and other aspects of uh, secrets that uh, are going on at the moment. And then fine-grained network access control as well. So I'll just talk a little bit more now about stateful sets. And so the reason we're interested in, in stateful sets in particular is because we would like to run data stores in OpenShift. So I already mentioned that we were running data stores outside OpenShift, and this is one of the things that ACS manages on the outside. And again, something that I would like to get rid of. Why not? Uh, it won't be now, but it would simplify operations an awful lot if, the, if, the, if Couchbase, for instance, could be administered straight through OpenShift, if all the actions like scaling up an OpenShift uh, Couchbase cluster, upgrading, uh, recovering a, a, a node that's keeled over, were all automated and seamless through the, the OpenShift uh, administration. It also would help in self-servicing. Uh, we can make it available through the service catalog. And also, it makes it easier to adopt future technologies if we can put everything in OpenShift, including our data stores. So, yeah, one of the arguments against that might be, for instance, well, what about infrastructure as a service provided data stores? I mean, I'm sure most of you have seen maybe on Amazon or on Google, there are, there are data stores provided out of the box uh, on Amazon, on GC. Uh, OpenStack also knows how to run data stores in principle and offer them as a service. So, well, I mean, 
if they if they suit, go ahead, use them, and I would too. I, I'd be interested in seeing them available through the past service catalog, so that I have my self-servicing that's uniform as well, maybe, but uh, that's something I, I need to think a bit more about and talk to people about, but um, definitely, yes, if, if the YAS has it, why bother doing it at another level? However, not all infrastructure as a service, cloud providers, provide the same data stores, and maybe the data store you want is not available on the cloud provider you're targeting. So then you're, you're going to want to run it yourself. And then if you try and run it in the infrastructure as a service, it's more complicated. You have to deal with the cloud provider spec specificities. You don't have a common operational abstraction. So we think it's interesting to actually do it at the pass level. Um, so I've already mentioned inclusion in the service catalog. Um, you can have native mechanisms for, for scale out and for update built in. The challenges, um, there's always performance. That was mentioned this morning uh, already. Though, in the end, if you're going to run on VMs, that's probably where the main performance penalty is, not the containerization. So we can consider using bare metal uh, open shift on bare metal and we'll pay less penalty for, for running our data stores. Um, we also have to think about cross data center replication. Uh, Couchbase, for instance, relies on a, a full mesh of connectivity between the Couchbase nodes of the different clusters in order to provide cross data center replication. So in certain clouds, that might be not too difficult because, I don't know, for instance, GCE, you have a, a flat network you can route from any machine to any machine uh, in any region on Google inside your project. Um, but that's not the case everywhere. And then there's also the challenge of finding the right level of abstraction for all of this. So you can see that People already have been interested in this for quite a while. Uh, templates for running various uh, data stores on Kubernetes or OpenShift have been available probably since the beginning that Kubernetes was made available. However, they typically have limitations. Uh, I actually, uh, there's only single instance in front of a few of these. However, I would actually expect that without stateful sets, they are all necessarily single instance, or at least you need some form of sharding of your data to be in place. So the way we're going about this is that we're working closely with, with Red Hat um, and at the moment uh, in particular Couchbase. This is the, the project that's gone the, the furthest forward uh, as far as I know. We've done a, a first phase where we can now run uh, rack aware Couchbase and uh, it implements also scale out, meaning you can add nodes to Couchbase on the, on the fly. Um, then we'll move on to a second phase. That's the content is still to be determined, but basically, of course, we need to consider upgrades, backups, restores, um, and we're interested in uh, failure recovery of nodes uh, being automated. We're also working with other vendors to get uh, MariaDB, uh, PostgreSQL, and Oracle uh, into OpenShift. Now, Oracle is actually one of the more interesting from my perspective because I think there was a fair amount of resistance, but they've, they've changed and they're now actually supplying themselves uh, Docker files or images so that you can run Oracle in a container. I think they're doing this for 12.2 and above. It's not supported for production use. But this is already very useful because you can just spin up an Oracle instance for, for dev and test and throw it away. And, and it's very easy to use. It makes Oracle very accessible to individual developers and things like that. So we're seeing a, a great interest in, in that area. We've actually contributed a few changes on that. And uh, we've managed to make it work on 12.1 as well and run 12.1 inside OpenShift. So the, the, the relevant things, the main relevant technologies here, it's stateful set, obviously, because we, we need the ability to bind an identity to a pod and bind it to its storage. Um, 
We also think third-party resources or aggregated or custom controllers of some kind are going to be relevant because uh, in order to make the, the operations seamless, uh, integrated in OpenShift, we're going to help uh, at least a little bit on third-party resources. Um, one, of, one of my colleagues is going to work on that with the, with the folks from Red Hat. And uh, finally, service catalog to make the, this uh, self-serviceable and available to the, to the end users of the platform directly. So just before I conclude, i just like to show briefly, I have a, I have a running Couchbase cluster. Ah, that's a bit too big maybe, hang on. Uh, no, sorry. Is that still legible if I do that? Uh, okay, so what I have is, uh, so it's a, stateful th it's a stateful set, and we're running, so three couch-based data instances here on my laptop, and I'm also running uh, the Pillow Fight application, which is uh, Couchbase's sort of demo app that does some reads and writes all over the place, and <coughs> So the nice thing is, so okay, I have to shrink that somehow. <coughs> okay, that was a bit too much. Um, so the, the interesting thing is down here, it's the graph of the operations going through. Um, so what that actually shows is, uh, that, that I think is interesting, is that Couchbase, the, the pods, well, the different instances of a Couchbase cluster, they need to be able to talk directly to each other, so they need to be able to find each other. And that was something that was a problem in the, in the beginnings of OpenShift and Kubernetes, because typically you would talk through a service endpoint, and there was only one for the whole service. So here what we see is that the, the Couchbase instances are indeed able to talk to each other, uh, to, to stay in sync, to agree on, uh, on the various aspects of uh, who has what data and things like that. Um, and, and this is part of what the pet sets gives us, which is this identity through which each pod of the replica set is, uh, is accessible. Um, and it happens to work. Okay. And, and just for the record, so this is... Uh, this is just a, th a three, oh, sorry, yeah, if I don't shift it across. So this is a, a three node, um, well, three compute node OpenShift cluster running inside uh, uh, Virtual D on my laptop. Um, and uh, so one infra node, just one master to keep things a little bit light, okay? And you can see they're working away a bit. So, right, just to, to finish off, um, so we, we're working on a, on a big change in the way we run our applications. We've already got some nice successes. There's still quite a way to go because you can imagine that with uh, 5,000 services and a couple of thousand physical servers in the, in the legacy system, we've got a, a way to go to migrate applications, all our applications onto OpenShift. But we've already got some running and uh, and the good thing is OpenShift keeps growing with every release. We're happy to be contributing. I'd love to contribute more, but that's always a, a matter of resources and time and things like that. Um, so that's it. I'd like to continue the adventure. All right, then. Are there any questions for Eric while we have him here? Hey. My question was, are you planning to use any Helm or charts, these kind of things, for the packaging? Do I plan to use any? Helms, Helms or charts. I'm sorry, I don't understand. Helm. Helm. Helm, ah, Helm. Helm. The, 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 the package uh, manager. Uh, actually, we started looking at that. We haven't been very far with that. Um, currently, we're not. We're, we're, we've actually built uh, a meta language internally because uh, it's one of those things where when we started, Helm didn't exist, so we developed our own way of packaging things and uh, producing the images and things like that. It's not on our highest priority, one of our highest priorities for 
shifting left in my previous diagram. Uh, so no, not at the moment really. A few people have looked at it, but that's all. Um, you, you mentioned that you have a way of managing secrets. Can you tell a little bit more about that? Okay, so the... the <laughs> <laughs> it's secret, no. Um, so, well, it, if you... Okay, the, the, the problem is that um, secrets inside the master aren't themselves encrypted. They're not encrypted in, in memory and they're not encrypted on, at rest either. Except if your, your volumes of your VM, for instance, that run your etcd are encrypted, maybe, okay? But as soon as the VM is up, they're, they're visible. So one of the constraints that I was given was we want the secrets in the master to be encrypted. So there, immediately, you have a chicken and an egg problem, which I haven't solved as such. But which is that if you want to have them encrypted in the master, then when they get to the pod, they have to be decrypted somehow, and somehow you need a key in order to decrypt them. So where does that key come from? How do you secure it? Does it itself need to be encrypted? And if it's encrypted, how does it get decrypted? Okay. Um, so there have, been, uh, there have been a couple of solutions, workarounds to that, that have been put in place. I think uh, Kelsey Hightower did one article, and it turns out that what I worked on, which was more or less about the same time as he was working on it, was essentially the same kind of thing, which is that basically, okay, we have a, a, some kind of security module somewhere which actually has either the encrypted form of the secret or has a key that allows to decrypt it. And what we have in the master is either just a reference to that or is an encrypted version that can be decrypted with a, a key f through the security module. So the security module could be a full-blown HSM or it could be Vault or something like that. And so what I do is that I use the init containers feature of OpenShift 3.3. And basically when a pod starts up, I have an init container which examines the secrets and my secrets, basically they're now a configuration that says where to get secrets from. And I control the access to, to those sources and I, I place, I actually, I actually substitute the secrets volume on the fly and um, so the, the pod sees, or the containers of the pod that need the secrets, they only see the final version with the decrypted secrets and the config is something that I manipulate in my init container to get the secrets from the right place. So it doesn't fully solve the problem of how do I prove that I am allowed these secrets or that kind of thing. Um, so it's not a full-blown solution. It's not an ideal solution. If you hack the master, obviously you're king of the cluster and you can do whatever you like. You're going to get access to secrets anyway. But it's, a, it's an improvement. It, it makes it harder. A hacker needs to, or cracker rather, needs to go through more steps to get to your secrets. And so you have more opportunity to audit that access and to raise alerts through a seam, that kind of thing. Any other questions? This is gonna sound like a trivial question, perhaps it is, but... Um Fairly controversial, and that is how do you how or have you implemented shared storage between pods? Uh, so, today in production we haven't. We we don't have shared storage in. I mean, for instance, the airline cloud availability doesn't need any shared storage. It's all uh, stateless, and uh, I mean, there's absolutely no persistence. Um, we so for the. Sorry, for the data storage part, there it will be necessary. So the idea is that you have to use some source of, uh, you need Cinder or you need ClusterFS or something like that. I have to admit, I don't know that we've actually selected one uh, solution at this point. 
Uh, I think that's still an open thing, but basically we will use some form of cloud-provided storage, block storage, uh, for, for, for the shared storage, for the data storage, the persisted data storage, which is what we're Mm, yeah. I, I think we have some studies ongoing for a data storage solution, uh, and I think there's one of my colleagues who want, actually wants to, to uh, try and answer that question, Diane. If you, if you Vito, stand up, and uh, then Diane will see you, and she will give you the mic. But, uh. So no, uh, we are moving away from uh, shared storage. So we, you know, on the data persistency, we, uh, with the, the NoSQL, we introduced local disks and flash. And we, even in the Oracle side, we are going away as well from rack and uh, from shared storage. Precisely because from operational standpoint, this complexifies significantly the model and generates a, 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 a less robust uh, solution. So we are moving away from uh, from uh, shared infrastructure components. Uh, now, for the uh, large volumes of data, yes, we are currently doing a study. Uh, we are studying the solution from uh, Red Hat, but also from other uh, providers for Object Store, and we will build an Object uh, Store backend soon. All right. Okay, maybe I misunderstood what was meant by shared storage then, okay. All right, well, <laughs> I, I want to thank Eric and Victor from Amadeus for this presentation today. Um, they'll be around most of the week, I think, at KubeCon and afterwards in the beer area. And if you hadn't noticed, I was soft shoeing and stretching it out because the man in, in the far corner is the next speaker and he's just arrived, Alexis. And we'll get you set up and give us a second. So thank you very much.